Just ahead on American Black Journal, the recent rioting in Baltimore again places the spotlight on interactions between blacks and police. Today we'll talk about both sides of the issue, law enforcement reform and how citizens should respond when confronted by police. Plus, we'll get an update on the progress of the M1 rail project in Detroit. Stay with us. American Black Journal is next. At DTE Energy, we believe that we have a greater responsibility. We believe that being part of a community means being involved in the fabric of that community, investing time, effort, and resources in the communities we serve. DTE Energy Foundation is a proud sponsor of American Black Journal. Welcome to American Black Journal, I'm Stephen Henderson. The city of Baltimore is trying to get back to normal following the violence, looting, and arson that broke out after the funeral for Freddie Gray. He's a 25-year-old black man who died of a spinal cord injury while in police custody. Gray is the latest black man to die at the hands of police, prompting protests and calls for law enforcement reform. My guest today can relate to the issue from several perspectives. He's the former mayor of Pontiac, who also served as a police officer in that city for 17 years. Plus, he's a former investigative reporter for the Oakland Press, and he wrote a book called The Todd Road Incident. It's about the shooting of an unarmed black Oakland University student by a white police officer in Alabama during the early 1980s. I'm pleased to welcome Dr. Willie Payne to American Black Journal. Thanks for being here. Thanks for the invite. So uh, give me a, a sense of how you saw what went on in Baltimore this week. What does that say to you about what's going on uh, in terms of the relationship between police and black community? What happened in, in Baltimore is commonplace of what has happened in major cities across the country. Sure. And certainly there needs to be a need uh, to address it in a more uniform way. There needs to be certainly police reform across the board. Uh, but I feel that those involved, the young men who have been shot by police, many of them uh, need to know or should have known how to properly respond to police. And there's a problem across this country with uh, individuals not knowing how to properly respond when confronted by the police. Uh -huh. You and I both know probably that uh, the right response could result in either getting a ticket, getting a verbal warning, being hauled into jail, being drawn into a confrontation that could cost you your life. Right. So what I have uh, proposed to do is to try and teach uh, young men how to properly respond. Okay, so let's start. You had two points there, one about uh, law enforcement reform, the other about how to respond if you're pulled over. Let's start with the law enforcement reform. From your perspective, what are the things that need to change in terms of the way officers maybe are trained, uh, in, in terms of how they're sent out and told what, what they ought to be doing? As it relates to training, I think there needs to be more sensitivity, sensitivity training courses, courses in ethnicity. Um, because when you are a police officer, you deal with a variety of people with different ethnic backgrounds. Sure. Uh, for example, when I worked in the city of Pontiac, we had a large Hispanic community. And oftentimes in the summer, uh, the Puerto Ricans and the Latins would uh, party outside. They'd play their music loud and they'd drink in public as if they were at home. At home, it was okay. But in the city of Pontiac, it was against it was the law. Okay. It was not. So as a police officer, you respond to the scene, you think that these folk know that they're violating the law, and they do not. Now, if I had, if, when I say I, that police officer, if I had some, some uh, training on the culture of that community, then I would know that these folk are simply engaging in uh, 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 activities that are commonplace to where they live, and I would not be offended by it, but of course, officers are offended by it. And on the same term, the folk, uh, the the, hits, the Hispanic communities, they are offended by the fact that by officers the response they get. Yes, because they think you're just messing with me right. for no reason. So there needs to be training from both sides. Right, uh, and that training costs money, of course. Uh, is that training that should happen when people are in the police academy, or is that something that should go on throughout your career? I think it career? should be ongoing. Yeah. It should certainly happen in the police academy uh, and should be ongoing, uh, probably quarterly, because uh, you have to understand 
you're dealing with a variety of people, people with different backgrounds, uh, different beliefs. Um, and different kind of, sort of cultural expectations yes, about, absolutely. about how their behavior will be uh, responded to. And I think when you have police departments and police chiefs and mayors who will engage uh, their officers in those types of training, you have a, a, a more well-rounded police department. Right. Okay, so then the second uh, part of uh, your recommendation is changing the way that, uh, that, that we talk to young men, especially young African-American men, about encounters with the police. Talk to me about the things that, that you're telling uh, young men that, that, that you What I'm encounter. telling young men, I have a, uh, I call it my nine plus one plus one ways uh, to addr address police or what not to do or what to do when confronted by police. And the number one thing is to cooperate. Cooperate with the police. When you look at those incidences that are happening across America as it relates to law enforcement and the African American community, of course, when police, when young black men are approached by police, there's a high level of, of resentment there. Uh, first of all, they think sure. you're just messing with me because right. I'm black. Right. So their response is going to be very negative. So what I'm trying to show young men is that the, how you respond to police dictates whether you get a traffic ticket, whether you get a verbal warning, whether you get uh, uh, drawn, thrown into jail. Right. Um, it all depends on your attitude. So we're saying just comply. If the police are asking you to, to do certain things, just do those things. And one of the questions I pose to the young people that I talk to, I, said, I ask them the question, if Michael Brown would have simply gotten out of the street, when the police asked Michael Brown, as, we relate, as it relates to the in Ferguson, Ferguson sure. incident, if Michael Brown would have simply gotten out of the street, would Michael Brown still be alive today? And the Perhaps. result, the, and the answers were... What do they say when, when you ask him that? They were mixed. Yeah. Some yeah. young folks. Well, I mean, say, I mean, I think some people could hear what you're saying and say, "Well, this is this is blaming the victim." I mean, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, 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 a lot of times, these young men not doing understand, anything. Understand, uh, I am not condoning the actions of, of police. Sure. When police take the lives of innocent people, they should be punished. They should be prosecuted. Right. But I also uh, have to explain to the young folks that uh, prosecution of police are very rare. Right. Because That's you true. must understand that police. And, and, and the prosecu prosecutors are all part of the same system. Yes. And many of them belong to the same country club or right. go to church together. Sure, sure. And, uh, but you're, and you're not going to have a large degree of prosecutions when it comes and to... And so what you're saying is uh, you, you, can, you can be frustrated with the system, you can be frustrated with the things that are going on, but uh, it, when it comes to that one-to-one -one interaction with Push a police those officer... Push frustrations aside uh, and sort comply. Of put that, and that's very, that can be very difficult. I know, uh, I do. know, but... It could it, it it takes a lot of lot of lot of resentment, but when you look at the overall picture in its totality, if it's going to save a life, then is what we worth, have to do yeah. is do what is necessary to save a life. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, uh, preserving uh, and a life. that's that's what's at stake here. That's is that, what's at stake. That if you push back, if you uh, you know, we saw uh, in Inkster recently. Uh, Floyd Dent, uh, he opened the car door and seemed like he was going to get out. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, the officers seemed to respond to that. Uh, they seemed to think of that as uh, an act of aggression, which it probably yes. wasn't. Uh, but but uh, perhaps if he hadn't opened the door, uh, they might have responded differently. But, but there again, I mean, I think a lot of people might see that as you saying, well, you know, these officers, uh, these officers are somehow justified for what they're doing. Well, I hope that they don't yeah. uh, come to that conclusion because, again, uh, I, I am not uh, 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 condoning uh, What you're saying is you need force. both sides to, to behave differently. We need differently. both sides to come to, uh, both sides to behave, yes. Yeah. Uh, and I think the end result would be, uh, you know, appealing to, to, to both sides. Um, I, too, was a victim of police brutality, even as mayor. You were, okay. Even as mayor. Uh-huh. Tell, uh, tell me about that. I was uh, on a road trip. Uh, driving from Scottsdale, Arizona to Las Vegas. I'd never been there, so I decided to rent a car and go to Las Vegas. About, uh, about a mile from the uh, Hoover Dam, 
I was uh, approached, uh, stopped by uh, several police. I knew, it was, uh, I knew it was a felony stop from the onset. Yeah. Uh, about five cars descended on me, stopped my car. Uh, officers armed with uh, guns forced me out of the car, handcuffed me, put me on the ground. Um, Did they tell you anything about why they were... I asked why I was being stopped. I was told to shut up. And I complied. Yeah. Because I was there by myself, and, you know, I've read stories and cases where you had police shootings, and those yeah. shootings were justified. Right. And uh, later on in the, in the story, you find out that the, the person had done nothing wrong. In right. this case, I had done nothing wrong. Right. And right. I asked, uh, at the point where they allowed me to talk, I did ask questions as to why I was being stopped. Uh -huh. And, it didn't and make you were the mayor of Pontiac. Yes, it didn't make any yeah. sense. Right. Got no apologies. But, of course, I left. Um, with everything still intact, right? Because right. I simply comply. And were you able to follow up with the with the, the I made departments calls later to, and and get some sort of response? I made calls to the chief of police there uh, and other authorities there with that police department names I won't I won't mention. Sure. <clears throat> but I was not uh, satisfied with the answers I got. Yeah. Well, actually. Uh, on on the scene, I was told the reason I was stopped because I was speeding, and I uh, had been uh, they had been That's following me. That's not the me. right response <laughs> to speeding, <laughs> no, though, is it? They had been chasing me for five miles. Yeah. Five miles. Yeah. Now, being the observant person that I am, <laughs> having worked as a police right. officer, That's trained a observer, That's right. I it was hard for me to yeah. to to accept. But that. but I mean I think the the lesson of your story is uh, comply up front. Deal with the consequences Deal with it later. later. Uh, yes. Live to be able to say uh, what you did was wrong, and we're gonna and we're gonna deal with that. Absolutely. And if, you, if you respond differently in the in the moment, you might not get that chance. And the leaflet that I um, give to those persons I talk to during my uh, town hall style meetings, there's a list of agencies. Yeah. And right. That they can that call. They can call right. if they feel their rights have been. Violated or that they that's the treated. right way to, to, to deal with these things. Yeah, so yeah. comply, complain later. Yeah. Don't fight in the streets because you lose. Right. You do your fighting in court. Okay. Thank you very much for being here. This is a really great and Thank you for having me. Yes. Yes. Just ahead on American Black Journal, spring is construction season, and one of Detroit's largest projects has kicked into high gear. We'll have the latest on the M1 Rail Project next, right after this look at some important moments in Detroit's black history. I'm Kim Trent with a look back at African American life in Detroit. This week in 1955, Dr. Remus Robinson was elected to the Detroit Board of Education. He was the first black to serve in that post. In 1956, Gotham Hotel Appreciation Week kicked off at the black-owned establishment located on John R. Street, just north of Mack Avenue. And in 1979, Eddie Jefferson, one of the most unique vocalists in the history of jazz, was fatally shot after completing a set at Baker's Keyboard Lounge. These are significant events this week in Detroit's black history, taken from the book, On This Day, African American Life in Detroit. Detroit's M1 Rail project has kicked off a rather aggressive construction schedule for 2015. The modern streetcar will begin operating late next year along Woodward Avenue between Larned and West Grand Boulevard. This year's construction plans include laying track in the Midtown neighborhood, installing a specialty curve track to get around Campus Martius, and completion of the Penske Tech Center. Throughout the construction, project organizers are vowing to maintain a clean and safe environment for both motorists and pedestrians. Joining me now from the M1 Rail Project are Paul Childs, who is the Chief Operating Officer, and Summer Woods, who is the Director of External Relations. Welcome to American Black Journal. Thank you. So this is a topic that is near and dear to my heart. I live downtown, I work downtown, and I walk back and forth uh, between those places all the time. So I see the construction and I have to sort of jump around some of it. Uh, but, but you're right, uh, as I said in the open, it really has sort of kicked into high gear. There are tracks now uh, that go up uh, almost past uh, the stadium and it, it's starting to look like a, like a railroad. <laughs> We, 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 we did kick this into high gear this year. We've yeah. got a lot of activity during 2015. 
Uh, we're actually further on than, than what you would imagine, right? Uh, is that right? Uh, yeah, we, we've got some track laid up in Midtown already, and we're, we're basically through the uh, the campus marsh. Or I'm sorry, the uh, Grand Circus Park area. We're, uh -huh. we're working very hard in front of uh, the Foxtown area. Um, but not only is, are we laying track, but part of the project is with our partners, MDOT, and so there's a complete rebuild of the road, but both of the bridges, I-94 and I-75, oh, are right. also under construction. Right. We had a momentous uh, event uh, last week where we did the deck pour on I-94 on the west, uh, west side of uh, I-94. So once that pour is set up and a few other things are taken care of, we'll end up uh, working on the other side of the bridge, right. which means if you were used to turning one way, we're going to have you turn the other <laughs> way go it, it, the other as, as you, as you uh, navigate up and down our, our obstacle course. Right. So. I, I, if, correct me if I'm wrong, but my original memory is that this was not supposed to open until 2017, right? Um, so now I'm now we're going to be up and running by the end of 16. We're going to work as hard as we can to get to that point. The project is com comprised of four different pieces. So what you're seeing right now is what we call package A, right, and package B. So package A is the main line construction along with all the road work, right? And package B is the Penske Tech Center. Uh, yeah, tell me what. Tell me about. I'm not sure. I'm uh, totally familiar with what that is. So, so what that is in in old parlance, right? From a streetcar days, it's the car barn. Okay. Right. And it, it'll also where be where the cars go home. That, that's where they go home <laughs> at night, and it's operational headquarters. Okay. And that's just on the other side of uh, of the boulevard, on the east side of the street there, between Custer and, and Bethune. And uh, we've got a fair amount of activity going on up there also. Okay. So. Okay. And uh, summer, uh, this is a disruptive uh, project <laughs> in the sense that it's taken over. Uh, the street, but but I hear from uh, shop owners and and other b proprietors on on Woodward that it's you guys have been pretty good about trying to make sure they're not too disruptive. Yes, we work very hard. Um, Nicole Brown, who's on our team, who does an awesome job at Demita, they actually are on the on the streets every day, talking to vendors, talking to all of our business owners, trying to understand accessibility. What are their concerns? What are their issues? And making sure that we can give them the tools that they need to communicate to their customers as well. So for us, it's important that they are happy as much as possible <laughs> yeah. because the the goal of this project is to create economic development and for right. people to, to sponsor and to be right. a part of these particular activities that are taking place downtown yeah when will we start to see construction of the the rail stops the the stations uh, so you're you, 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 you're actually seeing part of that going on right now so the first piece that will go in is the, is the civil piece or the, or the, 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 the bases, all right? So that's being done as part of the road work. Uh -huh. uh, and then during 17, or I'm sorry, during 16, you'll see what we call a vertical elements going in. So you actually see the station starting to pop up. You'll see the new uh, street lights going in. You'll see the new overhead cantonary poles be, being installed. All that is for next year. Right. Uh, you know, the, the criticism I hear of, of M1, and I don't hear a ton, but I do hear people saying, why are we concentrating on three and a half miles of, uh, of uh, track uh, that, that really does not connect um, you know, downtown to any of the neighborhoods or to the, to the suburbs when we should be looking at maybe bus rapid transit uh, is the idea for, for RTA. What's the, what's the answer to that? Why is this an important project and why is it worth as much money as being spent on it? Well, it's important because it's very catalytic for just overall bigger picture of transportation. So right. bus rapid transit, obviously there's still research that's taking place for that and can still happen as well. I think the thing that we have to, to, to learn to do here is to think of multi-modes of transportation. <laughs> right. It's not either it's or. It's not either or. Yeah. We can all coexist. And, and the other thing that's important with this is that it does connect multiple communities. I mean, it is downtown, midtown, New Center, North, and those North are end, sure. communities. And so that's what's important is to understand that you know with our project it also becomes a 60 million dollar match um, by the federal government that if it's a project that connects to our system mm -hmm. um, they can get 60 million dollars so if that's BRT if that's an extension of the line whatever the case may be but also we have a stop at Amtrak so when you have all these conversations so with the commuter absolutely yeah. to Ann Arbor people that work in Ann Arbor and live in the city and vice versa so it is about multi modes of transportation and getting us to think a little bit differently versus just getting in our cars let's right. walk let's ride our bicycles <laughs> You know, every, every day, day. Right. absolutely, right. absolutely. Well, uh, what about the people mover? Uh, will there be a stop that connects 
the M1 to the to the People Mover or multiple. I guess it'll cross it twice uh, at Grand Circus Park and uh, down at down at Larned. So Grand Circus Park is probably the closest location, right? Um, and and obviously that stop uh, for the People Mover has been under construction. That's All closed the anyway. Is, it, sure. But but that's to be open shortly. Okay. Uh, and it'll be opened in advance of our opening, so right. it'll work out perfectly. Right. Um, but the other thing we all, all have to remember, as Summer pointed out, we have to think about modes of transportation. Uh, and p part of that is walking, yeah. right? And there's, right. There, there's no we don't do a lot of that. No, here. There's no city <laughs> you can go like to, to that has public transportation <laughs> that says you don't have to walk a couple of blocks to right. be able to catch up. Right, right. Um, uh, what about uh, the possibility? So let's say we get, you know, we get to this point and it's open and you can ride up and down to, to the Grand Boulevard. What's the possibility to, to take it further out Woodward? And what's the possibility to maybe make it, uh, uh, you know, go onto other streets, grash it? Michigan Avenue, uh, the sort of spur streets that we have in the city. So let's talk about that j just a little bit. So, so the first piece is, is to understand, all right, that um, we have a regional transit authority now. Uh, right. And they have a role, right? And that role is... They're supposed is, to be planning transit for abs everybody. Absolutely. And, and, and we interact very, you know, on a regular basis. I, I was with them yesterday for a couple of hours. Um, so, so our team is, is integral in terms of working on that planning, but that is Michael Ford's role and the RTA's role, all right, and represented by the four counties for them to come up with a plan. And obviously there is a, a referendum that should uh, be on a, a ballot proposal late next year in order to help fund that. Uh -huh. uh, but the, the corridors that you named, the Michigan Avenue, the Gratiot, uh, Gratiot um, uh, Woodward, there are what they call alt alternative analysis going on right now okay. right, to, to understand the mode and, and as we said before there's more than one way to travel so maybe you do something there and maybe it's not a train maybe and it's maybe it's bus rapid bus, transit right, right? And, uh, and there's there's more than one way to to, uh, to to move people around yeah so yeah uh, what what uh, well, how will people uh, ride uh, this car I, I imagine that this is not going to be like the old trolleys uh, that we had or the streetcars uh, before those those trolleys what will be the the, the way that people pay for uh, the light rail, what will they notice about how this is different from anything we've ever had before? It's funny that you I actually just came back from Atlanta. Okay. Um, they have the Atlanta streetcar there, and one of the reasons why I really wanted to go there was to understand the fare payment process and, and what that process is. You look at a lot of streetcars across the country in order to make sure that they maintain headways, they have a trust but verify. Okay. So you have a fare inspector who's on the streetcar that checks to make sure that you paid your fare. That you but pay. you, correct. <laughs> but also to point, you know, to Paul's point about the RTA, the other conversations that are taking place is the connectivity with the other modes. So conversation with Smart, with DDOT, until there is the full transition with the RTA. Like, can you have a car? Can that I you transfer? Can... Absolutely, from... absolutely. Which I obviously see. that's been a conversation that's been taking place in transit <laughs> for a sure. hundred years yeah, here. It's, it's, a, it's uh, sort of an argument. It really. is. <laughs> it is. And so our goal is is to be a part of that conversation and make sure that connectivity is key because again, we want those that are transit dependents to be able to to use it and those that are you know living in the area, visiting the area. It is truly a mode for everyone that is going to be in the area. Right. Right. And and the cars themselves. Are are very modern. Mm -hmm. You know, they're very sort of forward-looking. This is this is going to be a sort of a cool uh, a thing to, to have in the city, right? Well, and, and there's a couple of cool things of, you know, to, to think about. Um, first of all, the last time there was a streetcar on a street in Detroit was 1956. Right, right, <laughs> right. Um, And so m many of the people that are probably watching this program don't remember that, right? Right. Um, sure. And, and uh, so so that that's a big step forward. But the other thing that that it'll be different here in Detroit is the off-wire technology. So um, we will actually be able to navigate um, well past 50% of our entire uh, you know, run up and down the corridor off-wire, battery powered. Oh, really? Right? Okay. Uh, and that's going to be a unique thing that is, that, the, that's, that's starting to take root in the, in the industry. But by far, we will have pushed it the, the further. So Detroit will be back again as a, as out a leader front. Sure. Right, out, out front in terms of uh, taking this technology and pushing it as far as we can. So. Right, right. Uh, and and the, uh, um, yeah, the the cars, how they interact with traffic. Uh, I think a lot of people are concerned about, you know, will, will traffic be able to move around them? Uh, will they get uh, right away on, on traffic lights? How, how's all that supposed to work? 
So it, it does go with the flow of traffic. Um, we go at the speed, the posted speed limit. So we are stationary. So right. there is an educational component. So it'll that has stop to go at in. red lights. Absolutely, and... it will. It will stop at red lights. We, we, you will see for at some of the uh, the intersections that there's going to be new lighting signals. That uh -huh. there's four lights and one is a white light. That's a transit only. That's for the. So point. there's a little bit of a of a, <laughs> of a headway, but not much. Um, but it is, you know, going to be a significant education component for us to understand how to coexist cyclists, pedestrians, and cars. Yeah. Um, as well. And I want to give you a chance to talk about you have some program involving youth here. Yeah, in the, in the absolutely. City. So we're excited. One of the things that's been important for us from the beginning of this project is to make sure that it is an inclusive project. Uh -huh. project. So not with our construction workers, that when you look out into the field, it's diverse and right. it represents the community. So yeah. it's not just the construction side. There's another side. You have engineers, you have communications. Those are within community relations. And so we're teaming up with Mayor Duggan. You know about the 5,000 jobs. Sure, the, the yep. young people For the young, working the in Grody, the summer. Yep, the yeah. Grody Detroit young talent. And so we're partnering with them and we're looking for nine interns. We actually have our application uh, process on our website. The application deadline is May 11th. And we also have just an information se session that's going to be on Tuesday, May 5th at the Matrix Human Services at 6 o'clock that people can learn more about it. But we're looking for Detroiters qualified, yeah. again, looking at different ways to make Come sure that our young people absolutely yeah. are a part of this as well. Okay. Well, I'm looking forward to that day I can step out my door and get on the train. It we are like too. it's coming soon. <laughs> yeah. Thank you guys for being Thank here. You. Thank Thanks you. Thanks for having us so much. Thank you. That's our program for today. Thanks for watching. You can get more information about our guests at AmericanBlackJournal.org. And as always, connect with us on Facebook and on Twitter. Plus, you can also hear our program now on WDET 1019 FM. We'll see you next time. At DTE Energy, we believe that we have a greater responsibility. We believe that being part of a community means being involved in the fabric of that community, investing time, effort, and resources in the communities we serve. DTE Energy Foundation is a proud sponsor of American Black Journal.